Dr. Bidisha Bandhavadhyay as our colloquium speaker today. So, uh, Dr. Bandhavadhyay did her undergraduate and postgraduate at Delhi University and then uh, stayed there. I guess some of you will uh, <laughs> find resonance. Stayed uh, at Delhi University to uh, do her PhD with uh, Professor Sheshadvi, who some of you may know. Uh, so, after finishing her PhD in 2017, uh, she went to uh, Chile at the Universidad de Concepcion, Chile, and she has stayed there since then and in various positions, and uh, she's continuing there, and she's part of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So, um, so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, about that and other things uh, from Dr. Bonis. Thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you. Yeah. I hope I'm on. Can everybody hear me? My voice is not yeah. in its best. Okay. So, I I mean, it will be interactive. Don't worry. You can ask me any question whenever you want. So, today we will be talking about one of the very interesting things uh, in the universe, that is black holes, which cannot be seen directly, uh, because as the name itself, black holes, from which no light can be emitted. And we know its presence through indirect detections in various ways. And very recently, I mean, not that recent, but still, like in 2019, we got the first what we could call as the direct image of a black hole uh, that was uh, from the black hole image of the, or the photon ring around the black hole of M87 by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So today we will be in general talking, uh, uh, look, uh, we will be trying uh, to see uh, regions very close to the black hole and what do we understand or what processes are involved uh, like physically observationally what are certain challenges and in general uh, so supermassive black holes uh, we, uh, we are going to talk about them and mostly they reside in the center of agents so and yeah, I mean, that's some of the funding that I work with, so they are there. So there are different types of agents. I think some of you are work, probably working with or almost, you almost 50% in this room. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah. so much in love. So yeah. 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 So uh, since I think this picture is very, very familiar to all of you, that there are different kinds of agents. And this is a general picture of a agent. And depending on what you observe, you name it that way. So some of them are radio loud. Some of them are radio quiet. Some have very strong jets, which you can observe. In some cases, the jets may be there, but you don't know about their existence. The most interesting part of our, where the power engine of the agent lies is in this accretion piece. So today we will look what happens in this accretion disk and especially regions very close to this black. So now you can change to that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah. So there are different types of accretion flows around black holes. So some of them are sub eddington and super eddington So what do I mean by sub eddington and super eddington So you know that the if there is a spherical system, uh, then if it emits light, there is a bound up to which it can have its luminosity. And that is called the Eddington limit and uh, on the luminosity, and which is given by this formula. 
So depending on the mass of the system, uh, you know what is the maximum luminosity that a spherical object can emit. And given the luminosity, you can, uh, I mean, calculate something called the Eddington accretion rate, which is 10 times the Eddington luminosity divided by the speed of light squared. I mean, it's the theory based on some the yeah, efficiency, like um, ten percent efficiency. That is the assumption that that is the system. Is point one m dot is exactly. So, uh, and that is uh, called the Edding Eddington accretion rate, and. When you observe certain object, uh, the bolometric luminosity, and if you know the mass of the system, you can calculate the Eddington luminosity. And then what you can, uh, uh, I mean, if you divide the observed luminosity with the Eddington luminosity, you can uh, calculate what is called the Eddington ratio. So Edding, uh, whether you divide the bolometric luminosity by the, Eddington luminosity, or you uh, divide the actual mass accretion rate by the Eddington accretion rate, it's the same because by this formula. And you don't know the actual accretion rate. You have to assume, I mean, you have to infer that that's uh, like you calculate uh, from observing. Uh, sorry, I mean, you calculate what is the volumetric luminosity. So the different kinds of accretion flows. So one is when it is accreting, uh, like it's close to Eddington uh, limit, when the accretion rate is close to the Eddington limit. And in that case, what happens is, first, it's like a thin disk, the accretion is. And very close to the black hole, the density is so high in these cases, uh, because if the, uh, the accretion, I mean, the if it is uh, in the Eddington limit, that is the accretion rate is close to the Eddington accretion rate, the density is so high that the energy uh, is trapped. It is unable to escape because of high opacities. And in that case, the, uh, the system gets heated and it's, it gets swollen up. And the excess energy, because it's unable to escape, gets advected onto the black hole. So these are also a kind of advection dominated accretion flows, but there is another kind of accretion dominated uh, advection dominated accretion flow you, you will come soon. So the next is when it's uh, accreting, but at a less, less than uh, these uh, very high states. And in which case the thin disk remains thin disk and they are radiatively efficient. Like the energy that is produced due to accretion gets emitted and they are optically thick, but not like these systems. Then comes the interesting things. Uh, there in, for, in um, the system. And these are interesting from the point of view of uh, observations like the Event Horizon Telescope, which wants to look at what happens around the event horizon. And if a system is optically very thick, like it's so dense, if the radiation cannot escape, then you cannot see fine structures like the photon ring or any gravitational effects that are there. Like you will see the disk if there's not any additional features in the system. So, uh, these systems are interesting. Like here, the accretion rate is close or less than 0 0.01, uh, edit, uh, 0 0.01, which is like 0 0.01 times the Eddington accretion rate. And in this case, the opacity is so low that the uh, the and the dense, I mean, the opacity and hence the density. I mean or vice versa, it's so low that the electrons and the ions, they are not in thermal equilibrium with each other. 
And as a result, it results in a two temperature plasma. That is, the ions are uh, because of these viscous track due to accretion, it gets heated, it gets heated up. But because the density is so low, it is unable to interact with the electrons and that heat. So the ions are hotter than the electrons. And these are relatively inefficient because the excess heat that is there in the ions is not able to get transmitted to the electrons. And thus there is not much emission from the electrons. So this excess heat so is trapped, and again that is swells up, and uh, that excess heat is then attracted uh, into the black hole. So these are also another kind of attraction dominated accretion flow, and they are called hot accretion flow because it, the system becomes hotter because of radiative inefficiency. And in this these systems. We also see that there are jets and outflows. So if the, there are no jets or outflows, we call them in the uh, quiet state. OK. And again, sorry. So let's come to the two interesting uh, uh, objects, M87, and then talk about Sagittarius state. So why is M87 so interesting? Like in this picture, we see that M87 has been observed across multiple frequencies. And so like, for example, if you see in the radio observations, so this is like the, you see the biggest structures in M87, like which extends for five up seconds. And then you zoom this part and you get, and if you zoom, which looks like a blob here, but if you go to higher frequency, you see that again, it's like an extended structure. It's not a blob anymore. And then you go on zooming this small blob, it also looks like an extended structure until the point that this blob, it, uh, like when you look at the heart of this blob, you see what you uh, was observed in 2019 at the black hole shadow. Okay, can anybody tell me why is it called a black hole shadow? By the name black hole shadow. What do you mean by a shadow? Somewhere in something is in front of our eyes, so like you know, come through the object, we get a shadow. Yeah, so I mean, suppose you see a sa shadow, what do you know about? What do you know? Like, yeah, I mean, it says that something is there yeah. whose shadow is so that's the thing. Like, we call it black hole shadow because we cannot see the black hole directly, but we know its presence because of this ring like structure. That okay, if this ring wasn't there, we would not know that there was a black hole. So, okay. And then you see them uh, like in the optical band as well as in the extremes. So M87 has a very powerful jet. It is very massive and uh, like it has, it's uh, interesting uh, at all uh, frequencies because it uh, tells, sorry, tells you the power, uh, power of the jet and various, um, so it's interesting to all kinds of astronomers and as well as theoretical astronomers. So we come to Sagittarius A, which is in the center of our own Milky Way. Now, when we see at the center of our galaxy, we do not see any black hole, but indirect detections through certain motion of stars for a very long time, like their orbital motion was observed over years, like you see here the data is from 1995 on 2003, which the orbit showed that there is something around which these stars are orbiting, and the mass has to be huge, uh, which is concentrated in a very small region. 
and that is possible only if it is a black hole. So indirectly, uh, like it was suggested that yes, there is a black hole, but can we observe it? And that is why the Event Horizon Telescope thought, okay, it's the closest black hole, let's see if we can observe it. So what is the Event Horizon Telescope? So the event horizon telescope is nothing but a set of different telescopes around the world, radio telescopes, which decide to work together using the principle of radio interferometry. So what happens? What is the advantage in doing that? So if you use the method of radio interferometry, uh, so the different baselines can give can result in the creation of a very large telescope. So building an optical telescope, which is, has a very large diameter, it's really difficult, or any other thing. And in radio, this method is very commonly used. So it's uh, like using different teles radio telescopes across the world, it has been possible to create a telescope which has a diameter of the size of the diameter of the Earth. And why is that important? Because the, uh, the resolution of a telescope depends on its diameter through this relation, where lambda is the wavelength in which you are observing, and D is the diameter of the telescope. So here are some interesting results of the historical results of the EHT images for M87 and Sagittarius A. These were the first sorry, <coughs> images of M87 and Sagittarius A. So these are just intensity images, right? just see the light. And on top of that, these two other superimposed polarization, uh, polarized uh, images for M87 and Sagittarius A. And very recently, I think in January, we have now the second image from M87, uh, which where the maxima, maxima is kind of rotated by the contributors. So, sorry, sorry, what was the second? Which one? This one? This one? Yeah. Oh, sorry. This one? You said the recent image? Yeah, yeah. So this is the recent image of the M87. But that is like... So it takes five years to analyze the <laughs> Oh, <I see>. okay. <laughs> yeah. So this is... When, uh, this was taken in the Transport from uh, <laughs> South Pole, bring it here. Yeah, it's a big uh, <laughs> challenge. Uh, I mean, some yeah, more I was kind of a little bit surprised that 2018 doesn't sound that recent, but yeah, that's what data was taken. Data was taken in 2018, uh, and yeah, the 2017. A few weeks back, I think it came, right? Uh, I remember January. January. Uh, so we have the image and paper of the 2018 data. Okay. Uh, Sorry. This has changed position as well as the brightness, or not, or it just falls color in place. Um, it can be. Uh, see, because over the year the technology algorithm everything improves, so the maxima. Uh, that's what I was telling. Uh, that you know, with multiple year we and. Also, the theoretical modeling can tell you better. Like this is but the image. But there is some is absolute scale. Scale, yeah. <laughs> so, do you think that there have been some changes you observed from the previous one and the recent one? Even in, even when you take account of all the you know, improvements in algorithm and yeah, so that is what I said. That the maxima peak has changed by thirty degrees. Yeah, that is important. <laughs> but this is M87. Sagittarius is more, way more variable. So, 
So why are these two systems interesting or what is the similarity or difference between these two? So M87 has a black hole mass, which is 6.5 times 10 to the power of 9 solar masses. While Sagittarius A has a mass, which is 4 times 10 to the power of 6 solar masses. So M87 is three orders of magnitude more mass, more massive than Sagittarius A. But it is also way farther, like it is at a distance of 16.8 megaparsec compared to Sagittarius A, it is at a distance of just 8.8 kiloparsecs. And these things, uh, these differences lead to very similar ring sizes. Ring, uh, by ring sizes, I mean this, uh, the region around the shadow. This ring diameter, the photon ring diameter is very similar. 42 micro arc seconds for M87 and 52 micro arc seconds for Sagittarius. And as I said that for M87, we have seen, seen a strong jet across all the uh, uh, bands. But in Sagittarius say, no such jet has been detected yet with any, at any frequencies. So what do you exactly see in that image? So if we see that there is a plasma moving around the black hole. So this is basically, this is the plasma in that region is. Plasma is ions and electrons. And these electrons are emitting photons. So because of strong gravity, these photons are deflected the photons that are emitted behind and below, uh, like around the black hole, they are deflected because of the uh, gravity of this black hole. They are lensed and what you see, these photons, when they bend and travel straight to the observer's eye, it gives an impression that there is a ring or like a, it gives an impression of a false, of a dip, like there is, nothing in between and then you see light around it. So the attrition base piece? This is the attrition base. No, is it perpendicular to the line of sight or? The, so it depends, like, uh, I mean, I will show you how the image changes with the disk orientation. So that was just like the intensity mapping. Now I will talk a bit about polarization of the, I mean, like polarization of the ring, I mean the polarities, polarized uh, light around the accretion disk. So what happens if you have magnetic, so all these systems have magnetic field around them. And if the magnetic field is weak and the system is accreting, it will drag the magnetic field along with it. So if the, system is accreting in this way and the magnetic field is weak, the accretion will drag it in circular uh, circular lines, for example. And the magnetic field, I I hope you all know what polarizers are, right? Yes. Like what how polarization of light happens. So the magnetic field acts as polarizers. So it gives an orientation to the light that is traveling. So it uh, if the magnetic field is in this direction, the light is polarized, perpen is, uh, polarized perpendicular to the direction. So here you see that the polarized light is radial. Whereas if the magnetic field is very strong, it tries to go against the accretions if the attrition flow is in this direction, it will try to push it away. And thus, it will be like the, uh, it will be radial. The magnetic field will point in the radial direction. And in that case, because again, the perpendicular, um, it uh, polarizes in the perpendicular direction. So the light will appear to be circle. And anything in between, like circle and radial, is uh, like is something where the magnetic field is 
the strength of the magnetic field is in kilogram. That is, uh, for example, if it is like this, you will see the orientations are tilted. It's neither circular nor pointing out. And this is what we observe both in case of M87 and Sagittarius. <coughs> So, well, I think a few days back, like maybe five, six days back, we have, oh, sorry, we have the uh, polarized uh, data from Sagittarius A. And the implications that we infer, what we did not infer from just the image, is that the magnetic field is stronger than that was expected. And the spin parameter that is constrained uh, through these uh, the polarization, uh, and uh, I mean, like the different models uh, when you compare with the data, and there are various things that are done. The best fit model gives a spin parameter of 0 0.94 and the inclination angle of 150 degrees. So I will show you something. Like we were talking about the inclination angle and uh, spin parameter. So uh, along uh, the road, like this is spin zero, this is spin zero point five, and this is spin zero point nine four. And here there are different inclination angles, fifteen degrees until sixty degrees. So fifteen degrees is very close to face on. Like if the Accretion disk is in this plane, like it's accreted like this. <laughs> edge on is like when the disk is in this plane. So if you see that when you change your uh, angle of inclination, the polarization, uh, the polarized light appears different, or even the image of the black hole shadow appears different. So it also depends on how much intensity, because you know these are referenced. Like uh, if uh, there is uh, that Doppler beaming, everything that comes into account when there is change in the inclination angle. So in phase one, the intensity remains almost same, but as we move towards edge on, then uh, the Doppler beaming is very strong and you see the intensity maxima are along the direction of rotation. Total intensity is plotted or polarized intensity? So it is polarized intensity on top of total intensity. So the polarized, polarized intensity, intensity the length of the arrow. The length of the arrow tells me the polarization speed. So, so in that, that's a, if I look at the bottom, like I took the bottom row, yeah. No, there are places where you don't see anything. Yeah, I because think. there is no light. There's I no mean, light. There, if there is no light, you cannot compare. Like, you do not, you won't get the polarization so signal. That is the, this is 60 degree inclination. That, yeah, that is 60 degree. I mean, I can read from my, yeah. So, page. And what are the x-axis? Which one? These so that, one. These are in RG scales. Like, uh, I think it is uh, 12. Uh, I mean, this whole thing is 20. Maybe 20. Yeah, years. I think something is written, right? That's the spin of the graph. Oh, that's the spin of the graph. Is that right? Yeah, this is the spin of the graph. Oh, yes. Zero point, so zero, 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 zero point zero nine four. So this is like a short straight black hole, and this is like a short black hole. Black so that spin parameter is not changing uh, much for the I means its inclination is more prominent. Change in inclination rather than in spin parameter. Uh, I think you should get have to the polarization. Both, both intensity and polarization. I think polarization probably is the same, right? Yeah. That's what there I is a difference between this and this. Like if you see between Schwarzschild and the, the spin one in case. Uh, but yeah, here the if you are it's uh, not looking very like a facial kind of thing, then there is difference. There is difference if you what? see the orientation and everything is different. Like it's the resolution is not very good. 
So actually there is difference because there is difference. Is the pattern is changing it's probably no. not so visible here in this screen. If I so if you right. see like this side is brighter, yeah, that's what this, I case, this side that is, is brighter. That's right. So if the intensity is brighter, you see the uh, polarization strength also. Any but that side is and that side is I mean. From our point of view, then how do you distinguish? Why is that asymmetry? Where is that asymmetry from? I guess that asymmetry is again for a 15 degree asymmetry. Which one? So, you know, if you go to the top right one, top, top right, right, and then you, you said that the top right and the top left are different in the sense that one side is brighter and the other side is brighter. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying for right. asymmetry. So, I am asking that. So, this is what the observer will see. Yes, so this is again, this is a model. Like, yeah. No, no, I understand. Yeah, this is what, what the observer is that expected. This left side and right side for the image, how is that determined? Which is left and which is right? That's based on the rotation axis or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it is based on the rotation axis. <coughs> like, uh, yeah, so the left side, left column is non spinning backward. It's, it's not spinning. This is short side, yeah. No, um, suppose I independently see these two images. Can I say which one is non rotating and which one is. Just by that seeing one, one picture, one you one cannot. One. You have to that's see that, all that, the things. That was, that yeah, was. because uh, when you see a spinning black hole, your uh, shadow asymmetry also changes. Like from this to this, if you see, like it's not symmetrical, whereas in this case, the ring is more symmetrical. Yeah, the inclination angle of image is so not that's what, uh, my impression was that in, inclination angle is making more different rather than the uh, spin parameter. I mean, both will make what I'm saying is all uh, these inferences are through a lot of analysis. No, that I am. Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying, like, just by seeing one picture, you cannot determine, like, it's... yeah, I guess, I guess what we can say is that just by seeing that one row, we cannot say that it is first child or spinning. That we can't say. But there will be differences. To understand differences, we have to exactly. you know, take other kinds of things in consideration. Right. So, and on the left hand side, uh, the, the gray scale is for. I mean, these I'm, are uh, different uh, contours like 75 percent, uh, 25 percent uh, region. That's for normal intensity, not yeah. unpolarized intensity. Yeah. And then the color. The, 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 what's the gray in color? So, so that has uh, differentiated like how strong the intensity is. Like, I think the point so and the color is the maximum intensity fields and this is oh, like right. the lowest intensity fields. So between this and this, like the 25% uh, intensity of the maximum intensity there, between this and this 50% and like in fields it's 75% So uh, this uh, slightly, so when you are saying stronger magnetic field, I mean this must be an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Is it a So this, this is the magnetic field. Uh, magnetic field or homogeneous magnetic field? So I mean, because the system to is dynamic, right? It's, it's rotating. Uh, 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 there is accreting material. It's Correct. changing. So your field so is not... Be, first of all, it should not be static. No, it's, it's not static. It's varying. Like, uh, and also, it must be inhomogeneous also, right? It is because like because of... Dragging itself, there are pockets when there are times when the magnetic field is stronger in certain regions, and in some cases, there are pockets where there is no magnetic field, right. Right? and it keeps on changing with time. Right. Like, so, then then when we infer about the magnetic field, like it's just because there is not radial, but sort of this kind of angle. So, here you so the it, it, it's like, is like there are very long, uh, like the length of the uh, these lines uh, determine what is the polarization strength. So the longer lines are like high, high polarization, polarization and these small lines are low polarization. That is obvious. Yeah, yeah. and that again it tells you what is the magnetic field strength. Okay. So shall we go further? Or yes, please. Okay. So now comes 
now I come to what I am working on and uh, what uh, like a bit more towards my research. So given all these images and other things and we were discussing, uh, so if you, we see an image, okay, this is black hole shadow, but how do you know that's a black hole shadow? And at the same time, theoretically, we model things in computers. Like we, for example, this is a computer simulation. Now, how do you know this simulation corresponds to this? Right? So that is where my work becomes important, that I connect this to this. Or I try to not just connect, try to understand what happens between in, inside a computer and what happens on the sky when we see images. So um, uh, we, what I said is like that was a computer image and a computer, inside a computer, we simulate a system like the accretion region around supermassive black hole. And such simulations are difficult, especially when we take into account general relativity. It becomes very computationally expensive. And so these simulations are done in scale-free units. Scale-free units means assuming uh, g equal to c equal to m equal to 1. Mm -hmm. And Okay, so these, uh, first of all, I would like to say that these simulations are performed by my collaborator, Christian Sen, who is in MPIA, Heidelberg. And uh, so you start, uh, what happens in these simulations? You assume a certain structure. For example, in these simulations, you assume you start with the disk, which is like this, and the magnetic field strength, like, which is always there. Okay, these simulations are different from the simulations that are there in EHT, so the results will all be different. We are not comparing anything, it's just like understanding certain things. And then this simulation is led to evolve with time, unless you come to a kind of steady state. So you start with this, and what you ultimately get is this kind of thing. So, um, I mean, what Christian does is like he uses a resistive version of, we call them GRMHD simulations. And the standard one is like HAN, which is used by a lot of people all over the world. And here we assume a thin Keplerian disk. Usually the one I saw, uh, showed before, they are thick torus-like disk. And here it's like comparatively thinner than that. And there is always a large scale magnetic field. So if you see the magnetic field is all over throughout. And uh, because of this particular model, it is easier to have uh, um, like magnetic reconnection, which causes heating and the diffusion of the magnetic field, which leads to an impact on the mass plus. So the next thing that we do is post-processing. So from post-processing to ray tracing, where I come in. So if I want, suppose if I want to understand what how M87 behaves, so then I have to put in parameters of M87, like the black hole mass or the inferred accretion rate, the spin, uh, uh, the spin and the magnetic field, uh, the spin is already embedded into the code, like you cannot change the spin in a GRMG simulation, uh, or uh, like when you are doing post-processing. And the magnetic field is inferred given uh, the mass and the accretion rate. And then the next thing that you assume is what kind of emission that you want to see. Like whether you want to see emission from thermal electrons or non-thermal electrons 
or if you want to see synchrotron emission or any other thing like black body emission or things. And then finally, you have your radiative transfer equations uh, after re rescaling. And then there is what we call as ray tracing, and which from which we can uh, create <coughs> emission maps or spectra. And then we can understand, uh, and this gives me the this previous this previous image, like this is a ray trace uh, image of a simulation. So these are three D simulation, or uh, so. For this particular case, it's called a 2.5D because it's axisymmetric. But yes, it's uh, 3D, but like you yeah, assume axisymmetric. But in general, like you, what you see for uh, EHD, they are fully 3D. <coughs> so I will just show you a video. Will it work? Yes. I have to play it down. Yeah. So how ray tracing works? Yeah, can see it. So the rays from the black hole, <laughs> like they come, and what I showed earlier. So this is your plane of the disk. This is the accretion disk. So this is how the rays are traveling and giving you the image. So this is when the disk plane is uh, edge on. Now, see. By changing the inclination angle, you see a different structure. So this is when it is face on. Did you understand? Or do you want to see it again? Do you want to yeah. Okay. Yeah, can you maximize yeah, this? Maximize. Yeah, sure. I so think so. Full screen. Full screen. Full screen. It's not going. Okay, then let it I can share the link. No, <laughs> and it's forward ray tracing, not backward. It is back. I mean, what you do in the computer is backward ray tracing. You take from so the camera. It shows forward. It shows forward too because it's easier to uh, see it like that. Yeah, so since you mentioned uh, forward ray tracing and backward ray tracing, so forward ray tracing is when you take the rays from the black hole to your camera, and backward ray tracing is when you take the rays from your camera to the black yeah. hole. So what you do like in these ray tracing courses, you go backward. Okay. Click on what? Just click. That's what I did. Yeah, it's working. It's working. Oh, it's working. Okay. I didn't see that. It's done, right? Ah, um, what happened? I just left the screen. I'm so sorry. No problem. It's okay. So. Yes. Okay, but then how do I go to full screen? View your file management view. There should be a slide show. It's open for what? Yes. Open for what? Yeah, the just put it in the that you would have a slide. The slide show option. The slide show option. I think it just to. 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 It's, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So this is uh, the entire process of simulation, post processing, and ray tracing. So let's come to. Okay. 
Okay, watch it once again. <laughs> I think so. I think so. It should. <laughs> because it went and then I don't mind. So, this is the photon ring. It is. So. Coming to radiative transfer. So yeah, here uh, is the team from UNIC, uh, which has been doing uh, post processing and ray treatment. And here is my boss, Dominic Schleicher. This is me Lager. He works uh, in with the Event Horizon Telescope. He's uh, like an observer and works in imaging and calibration. And these are uh, two master's theses uh, students who are working with me and who recently uh, finished their master's thesis, Javier and Felipe. So, in, uh, when you, uh, for understanding radiative transfer, what you need is the temperature of the gas, the density, and of course, the density is needed to any further temperature, the magnetic field strength, because these images, since we want to uh, see what the event horizon telescope sees or can see, so those emissions are in radio bands, and in radio bands, what we see is synchrotron emission. And synchrotron emission is possible only if there is magnetic field. And then what you assume is the electron dis distribution function. So this is your intensity, which is given. Uh, by the electron distribution function and the energy. So, and if you remember when I was explaining accretion flows, I said that these two uh, these systems have two temperature plasmas. That is, the ions have are hotter than electrons. So these simulations are not plasma simulations because plasma simulations are more complicated to be, especially to be done in GR. So you assume like it's a gas, but then by hand you uh, do something so that the electron and proton temperature are different. And also like when the magnetic field strength is higher like in the jet, the, it, the distribution needs to be different than in the case of this. So for this, there is a prescription that was used in a general, which was uh, formulated by like, Mots, uh, Monica Motsi in 2016 paper. So these are post processing. Yes, these are post processing uh, for but, uh, the uh, the scale the simulation had assumed some kind of magnetic field. Yes, there is a magnet, intrinsic magnetic field. What I'm saying is uh, the magnetic field distribution is there. For synchrotron emission, you need to consider like the no, magnetic but, uh, You have to take that magnetic field knowledge. Yes, Can yes, it, you cannot change no, no, from the scale. Change. No, because if you change your uh, density parameter and if you change your mass of the black hole, it will automatically scale your magnetic field strength. Yes. Isn't it a three parameter? It is a relative parameter. It is also that's how probably it's done it's, in the simulation. Yes. How we say it out. It's plasma beta. It's like beta <laughs> is in nature that magnetic field will depend on mass or density. But no, but the black hole mass is does not regulate the magnetic field in the no. No, it it doesn't regulate the magnetic. I'm saying it will relatively change, like the strength will be scaled accordingly. See, beta parameter is chosen, which is the pressure of the gas by the pressure of the magnetic field strength. Right. So the if the pressure of the gas changes because of scaling the density, the beta. 
Yeah, because I just want to see what is happening. If I take very large resolution, I mean, I won't see what is happening close to the. That also I can change. Like I can choose. But then you have to choose probably based on what HD or. Yeah, what I want to see. Like if I want to see very large scale jet, then I will use a smaller resolution. If I want to see what is happening close to the horizon, then I will choose a larger resolution. Okay, then other parameters like this is the inclination angle. So, yes, if you change the inclination angle, there is a change in the spectra. If you see, there is a change. Uh, uh, around the peak, thermal and thermal plus non thermal. So this is just thermal, this is just non-thermal. <laughs> so if you are giving non-thermal, you just see the disk, the jet here is not visible much. And if you assume both of them, you see a lot. And then there was this temperature parameter, like when I said, like we assume a certain prescription to assume a temperature plus and there if you vary the different parameters, you again see that there is variation in your intensity maps and also your spectrum. So when you want to compare, you have to see all these things, like whether they match the spectra, whether there is similarity between the images, and then you can infer the physics that is going on in the system and what you infer from yeah. your simulations. Can you go to the previous slide? Previous one? Yeah. So there is eighty three centimeter per mile, centimeter per mile. Seven. 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 So it's a jet wind. Yeah. So this one. Like if you see very, <coughs> uh, like there, it looks like a very faint jet. Yeah. Okay. So what we have, or uh, like what we are doing is. Uh, so Christian simulated some six systems uh, and we wanted to see what happens like if you have jets and other structures like and uh, then we wanted to like because M87 and Sajay like we have the images and we have a lot of information from these two systems so we scale uh, all these simulations according to uh, with those parameters from M87 and Sagittarius. But the differences in our simulation, like for example, there is one Schwarzschild black hole, and then there are some simulations where the magnetic field uh, strength is taken to be much larger. So simulation wise, like here you see the density and the magnetic field uh, differences. And this is when, like in the final, uh, like, when the system has reached a steady state. And this is the velocity map, like what is the velocity, um, like the flow velocity in the simulations. Okay, so what we do is, we have the data from different observations for both M87 and Sagittarius. We try to simulate, like we fix the black hole masses and uh, for M87 and Sagittarius A. And then we change the accretion such that we get a match, uh, the model spectrum matches for each of the simulation is very much similar to the data that we observe for these two systems. Why is this done? I mean, we want to see like how these, uh, different set of simulations behave under these conditions of flux when you constrain the flux and when you constrain the mass of these uh, like these simulations uh, so these different lines they're all from different simulations right yeah the different lines are from different yeah, so what, what's like what's the difference between like in this in, in this different simulation or like what's when changed between okay so that's given here so for uh, for example uh, this one uh, like this uh, 22 years, 
I mean, they are given by different IDs. So 22 EF is a Schwarzschild black hole, for example. 24 EF and 26 EF, like they are, they have the magnetic field strength is very high compared to the other simulations. And like in some cases, there is something like called the flow density. Like when you run simulations, you have to adjust that to keep your simulation running. So those parameters have changed between the different simulations. Okay. So, so spectra cannot uh, distinguish between any of the simulations. Uh, it can. Uh, but when you rotate, like... So right now, whatever the... Means, uh, yeah, but the thing is, you cannot rotate your black hole. Like, when you observe your... No, no, no. I think he is asking that these points cannot distinguish between these lines. No, because uh, other, I mean, either you... Data points. Yes, data points. So those two data points are for M87 and... Sagittarius. And all the simulations satisfy more or less satisfy. More or less, because I'm fine-tuned. I, I, I can just say which one is best, which model fits it better than the others. Like, for example, in this case, a simulation yeah. 20 yeah. fits better than... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then if you see the image, it will be like weird. So then we have variation with frequency. So for all these six simulations for M87 and Sagittarius, so the upper ones are M87 for all these cases, and the lower ones are for Sagittarius. And uh, I, um, I mean, I created these artificial images at 86 gigahertz until 700 gigahertz. So if you see at low frequencies, 86 gigahertz, you see more features like use, and these are edge on views. So for example, in this case, you see like a very strong outflow from the, like a chair. But again, for M87, for the same simulation, you don't see a similar structure. So you see like the same simulation under two different circumstances gives me very different results. Why they are varying with frequency? Because we are seeing one just a non thermal emission and another. No, both are thermal emission. The frequency, what the thing is, you probe deeper and deeper. So the high energy uh, optical, depth, is, optical, optical depth, depth, depth is changing. Yeah. So for uh, like these photons, so jets always look different. Yeah. yeah. Because of the. <clears throat> So, like this, for example, like if you see this particular simulation, I think this is uh, this simulation. If you see it at different viewing angles, you it looks different. Like here, you don't think it has a jet, but at certain angle, the jet starts appearing. Like this. so, it also depends on like. You know, whether the system is jetted or not, it depends on whether you fall in the line of sight of the so jet. You are changing the frequency and in which frequency you are uh, seeing the inclination only or in just changing the inclination and it doesn't let us see? No, the, everything is similar. For I'm just seeing, for the same setup, I'm just seeing what it looks at different frequencies. And then uh, each of these columns might be different. Yeah, they have different the inclination six, and yeah. for example, things. this these six are uh, for all of them. The upper six are M eighty seven, and the lower six are Sagittarius. Okay. For for which frequency? What is changing between the people? So, for example, this is a question: Is that if you look at one slice, let's say, okay, if you look at two thirty gigahertz, mm -hmm. you said that the lower two rows are for Sagittarius, Sagittarius yeah. upper two rows are for M eighty seven, and these column? three are uh, different. Uh, these are different uh, simulations. So this is oh, like different. different. So this one is like the Schwarzschild black hole. Yeah. These two have very high magnetic field strength. So this is similar to what was uh, done for the previous image, but in a different color. And some parameters change, so they look different. Uh, uh, so, though, but the simulations are same. The simulations are the ones that I showed you. So 
So for example, here, so this is Sagittarius A, 86 gigahertz. For these two simulations, you see these extended structures. Now, if you see the extended structure, and this is H on view, you see a slight orientation towards a particular direction. And this we think could be because of some outflow signature. Okay, now we come for those same simulation, we come to low inclination views, that was phase on 17 degrees and 163 degrees, by 17 and 163 degrees, because they are the angles taken for M87. <laughs> so if I change the inclination angle, now, if you see the face on, they look very symmetrical. Like there's not much change. But if you see at low inclination angle, one side is brighter than the other, like you saw for M87 or Sajid. But then, do you know, like, can you say something whether any of these systems can have outflows or not? And by the way, one of uh, each row represents a particular simulation. Anybody, do you think like any of these simulations could have some outflow signature? Oh, maybe, I don't know. From these low inclination angles. One of them I think. Okay, I will just suggest, uh, I mean, I will say, for example, this simulation. So this is 17 degree and this is 163 degree. So one is like facing you if you think the spin is, or the, there is a jet, it is facing you and in the other case it is. So in one case it is brighter and in one case it is not. So if there is an outflow asymmetry mm -hmm. between the upper half of the disk and lower half of the disk, such a possibility is there. Also in this case, like if you see, one side is brighter, uh, like on the left upper direction, and this is brighter on the left lower direction. This can also be due to the Doppler beaming of an emitting jet. Okay, so this is what we see, but we need to quantify it better. So we what we do is we take slices of those previous pictures on X, Y, and then two diagonals, and we plot the emission profiles. And from the emission profiles, I have also plotted something like the photon uh, ring, which is at 3 RG, and then the lensed photon ring, uh, the inner and outer boundaries at 5.2 and 6.2 RGs. So for example, simulation 22, this is a Schwarzschild uh, black hole. If you see, there is a peak which always coincides with the 5.2 line. And in other cases, there is a shift when you change the inclination angle. So in your example, there are different simulations and in y-axis, there are different intentions. No, in y-axis is uh, the different simulations. Upper, upper six are for M87 and lower six are for Sagittarius A. And these are different inclination angles. And what are the different uh, colors of the... So that's what I said. Like one is uh, the edge on cut, like along those images. One is the okay. vertical cut and then the two diagonals. So when you, uh, I think the blue is when it's zero. So there you see the maximum asymmetry. When it is 90 degree cut, you see the least asymmetry because, because this is your accretion disk, right? Like accretion thing. So your, um, what, what do you call it? Um, the Doppler beaming structure, like you see the maximum difference at that angle, unless it's face on. In face on, they all will, like they will almost go inside. Like, when I equal to zero, but you start seeing the differences with I-70 uh, or 163, see? Like they are all overlapping in I equal to zero, but the differences start at these two inclination angles. So, okay, so the, these are all idealized images, like this is what you get from your simulation. You do the radiative transfer ray tracing, but 
the main problem is with telescope. You cannot image with such perfection with the telescope. So we do what we consider now is we consider the telescope resolution for uh, um, for so this is with the event horizon telescope uh, present. Uh, it may be a bit better now because of uh, different better image processing algorithms. But this is what was originally observed for M87. And then we have assumed uh, like a geo VLBI like baseline, which gives me a resolution of five micro second. And then L2 VLBI like baseline, that is when you place a satellite uh, with a radio interferometry at the Lagrangian point two. And you get a resolution of 0 0.16 micros per second. So which do you think res uh, resembles the one that we saw originally? Which of the three baselines? Yeah, the end of because that's the best yes. resolution. Right. So yes, so you can see that how badly your actual data gets affected because of the limitation of your telescope resolution. So with the current resolution, EHD resolution with our kind of models, what you can just say is like this one. For example, this is very different from the rest of them. Because, so this is the non-spinning black, uh, black hole and rest of them are the spinning black hole. So with the models that we have, uh, and with just the intensity map, the HD like resolution that is 20 micro and you can just infer a spinning black hole from a non spinning one. But if you want to extract better features, you have to go to better baselines or create larger telescopes. And yeah, so again, with the emission map, you see like things get better with the larger baselines. So I think, yeah, here I leave you with my summary. And if you have any questions, you can. OK, question. There are a lot of questions. Yeah, yes, they are not. I could speak. Change the attention. The black hole spin itself may not change the efficient. Like you are saying, if you have a non spinning black hole and a spinning mm -hmm. black hole, uh, I don't think so. That alone does it. It depends on a lot of factors, like you know, how much gas is around the black hole, how massive the black hole is. So, so mass definitely changes. Mass definitely changes the equation. But then spin might also have spin. Uh, what this? Uh, okay, if you have a different spin, then the isco radius changes. So the material gets closer to the black hole, and if it gets closer, then your intensity, like you know, what you see, the photon ring intensity may be different. So. It might have, but it's unclear. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the mass definitely mass has. Mass. Mass. So the primary effect of spin is that the uh, dynamo stable circular orbit radius changes. Yes. But that change is limited to six gravitational. Yes. Beyond that, so accretion rate, it has to if it has to change, then that has to have that have to happen in out, further out from the black. Yes. But and their spin has no much history. effect, like it doesn't affect. Yeah, the... unless we fully understand the equation flows, but it might have, but it's not a so the thing is in GR, you, like beyond a certain point, yeah, yeah, you do not expect, like, unless it's a different kind of uh, relativistic theory, there might be some effect, but otherwise. So within the realms of GR, you don't expect, you don't expect so much change. Okay, we really don't know about the origin of the jets, but is there any parameter or something in your simulation which uh, uh, tell me, okay, uh, if I change this thing, uh, jet can okay, uh, Yeah, yeah, so in these simulations, for example, like um, the simulations, I'm not talking about what happens in case of observation. 
So I was talking about the flow density, right? So for example, um, um, I mean, what Christian did is he was increasing the flow density and uh, like at, I think this one, for example, in this case, if he increased it more, there was no jet. Like if you go on, but the flow density is something artificial. Like, you know, you do it to stabilize your simulation. So I don't know. I mean, I'm not a simulator, so I cannot uh, tell you for, uh, but yeah, definitely, for example, uh, like the magnetic field strength, if you change the magnetic field strength, the jet launching mechanism changes. So, so like for example, in these cases, the magnetic field strength changes your jet and outflows are different. So this is Guruta side where you talked about the accretion mechanisms. The accretion flows? Accretion. Uh, the second one. So <coughs> there was the yeah, there was the values of the different ratio and so in the bottom two pictures, I can uh, see the jets. Is it the universe of the jets? No, no, this is not jet. This is the magnetic field line. So the yellow thing is the fluffy. So this uh, advection, like the fluffy. The advection dominated accretion fields. So what is jet out of the field? The pink ones, the third pink Yeah, the pink ones. So is there any um, probable relation between the jet out of and that? Uh, Yes, uh, so the thing is, um, your jet outflow power depends on your Eddington ratio, like, uh, especially for these kind of systems. Uh, you cannot have, I, I don't remember the limit exactly, but uh, you cannot have the jet outflow rate, like, beyond a certain fraction of the accretion flow rate. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, can you go to the slide where you show the feeds to the spectra with different simulations? Yes. No. The wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. This one. Yeah. So from the left, I see that there are a few data points in the middle which are like not fitted by um, any of the simulations. Is there any particular reason? Okay, well, first of all, um, this is the region, like up to this is where we want to do a radio fitting. If you go beyond that, it is no more radio. What we want is fit to the data with very high resolution, which is currently possible with VLBN. And also, if, when you go to higher frequencies, there are contaminations, like other, and also the resolutions are not that great. So this is what I'm doing is very close to the black hole, right? Like, uh, but the data points are even at higher resolutions. Yes. When you do the simulation, you assume gas, but in reality, it is plasma. So it's ions and electrons, but what you do is uh, you, uh, that's what I said, like, uh, wait. Yeah, so. Either particles or fluid elements? Actually, so what particles are you I think it's ions and electrons. So what I said, not like electrons, I don't think it's electrons. gas, I mean, what you assume is gas particles. What you do is to convert it into an uh, electron proton like prescription, you assume this kind of uh, a prescription like the electron has a different temperature and the ions have a different temperature, assuming this, this kind of a relation which you put in your radiator, like the when you are considering temperature of the electrons from your radiator for radiative transfer. Okay, other questions? This magnetic is coming from the plasma, right? Yes. So, can it happen that the charge is like a screen? 
Usually it's assumed that in nature yeah. there is a charged thing, it will be neutralized by, you know, because there is charged particles are different. So there will always be ions or electrons that will go and make it neutral. Yeah, I mean, there, there is not heavy motivation for having charged black holes in the universe. Sometimes it's spin on the spin. So, uh, I have one question. So, the spin that was measured for Sagittarius A star that is 0.9. So, spin was not measured, it is inferred yeah. from the model fitting. Uh, okay, and uh, so similar kind of uh, inference is drawn about MAT itself. Uh, that is also very hard. Yeah, it's also 0.94. So, I mean, well, the same 0.94 for both. I see. I mean, I mean uh, for M87 from the image itself, like uh, the magnet, uh, it did not require the polarization image for that. The magnetic, uh, the intensity map itself gave me that fit. Like, I think it's that. not that sensitive to point nine four or nine. Uh, what I said is the model which matches all the parameters. The polarization as well as that was inferred previously from the dynamical image. It, uh, like considering all the parameters, that gave me the constraint that this model with the inclination angle 150 and the spin parameter 0.94 is the best fit, like which uh, passes all the criteria. So, I mean, for safety, so these are now these are safer. These are low accretion rate uh, black. So even for uh, black holes activating at, let's say, nearly a limit, people, when they measure some, there are other, I mean, from mm -hmm. light, iron line to color something, people get very high uh, spin parameters. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so across a very large range of accretion rates, the spin of the, I mean, all black holes simply spin, spinning. It's, it's fast. Fast. In that yeah. something. I don't know what. So there are two answers to this. One is that, you know, I mean, the sun, if you take take the sun and make it a black hole, it will be very highly spinning if you conserve angular mm -hmm. So it's possible that most of the black holes are highly spinning. On the other hand, these may, may, major, measurements are uncertain. There are certain there, there are various things, so it's possible that there is some bias in the measurement. Yeah, like for example, in Sagittarius here, you don't see a jet. So you can assume, uh, I mean, you can think that since we don't see a jet, it may not be spinning. Like what could be a possible reason why, is, uh, like if it is accreting, like for example, uh, so, you know, like the polarization paper has had a prediction that there is a possibility of a hidden jet, but maybe our telescopes are not sensitive enough to detect that jet. So nobody says that Sagittarius A doesn't have a jet. They say, our telescopes have not been able to detect. So uh, I'm a little surprised that you, you said this in the talk also, uh, that there is no jet. But there were papers by Dibongar, Moitra, Sarah, Markov, etc. in 2010, uh, who showed that some of the radio features and some of the extra flares that happened that were detected by Chandra, yeah, flares, they, were, but, uh, they were from a jet. Yeah, but... I don't know. I mean, like you know, for M eighty seven, you know, it's a steady state jet, like you see. No, from obviously, the... our galaxy don't have a strong prominent yes. jet, but it has. I mean, if you ask me, my impression is that there is evidence for a sort of uh, low power, very uh, weak jet, because there. I mean, you know, there are not too many observations, but there are some observations that. Has shown that there is. Yeah, I think Sarah's money, but those 2009, 10, 8, Sarah's, many of these papers were talking about the Sagittarius jets. So essentially, they, so they detected some extra flares mm -hmm. in Chandra, and there are some concurrent radio observations. And then, of course, the conclusions are very model dependent, but at least there are some model dependent results. That said, that it is consistent. The observations are consistent with having a weak jet. Okay. So, 
So if you start, I mean, I don't know. Like with the happen. current status, what I know is that it has not been observed yet. Like uh, that. Confirmed or not? Some model dependent uh, inference is that could have certain up to certain limit. Other questions? Yes, sorry. Yeah, in this slide, where you actually ask us uh, by seeing at the simulation pictures whether we can infer there is a J or So, yes. Yeah, you said that when the inclination angle is 17 degree, we can see there is that is brighter than the 163 degree inclination, right? In those two pictures, yes. But uh, this means there is a unipolar change. In 17 degree, the jet is your size, and in one mm -hmm. that is the opposite. But uh, what is the model that is suggesting that there will be a unipolar jet, not the bipolar jet? Okay, what I, I didn't say a jet, what I said is like the there's asymmetry in the yes, disk emission yes. above and below the disk. Yeah, what is uh, it has the asymmetry in so it is like you know it's a dynamical structure like it is flowing now how the flow how the magnetic field strength changes or the different density parameter changes and this is a snapshot like it, it can change with time right so when you take an image uh, so like of course here i'm changing the inclination angle in reality you cannot change the inclination angle. For example, in case of M87, what you see is one-sided jet. Yes. So can you say that the other jet is not existing? What you yes. can say yes. is that yes. it is because the, it is dot. What you say for sure that you see the forward jet because it is Doppler beam. Exactly. And maybe the other jet is there, but, but you don't see it like yeah. because it is... Okay, no. simulation should give you yeah, the, yeah, whether I, there I, is a jet or not. Yes, yes. Like yes. In my simulation, all have upper and lower jets. Like whether they are equal yeah, strength. Uh, yeah, yeah. The great, the, the good and bad. I think the good thing about yes. the simulation is that we totally know no, what is exactly. Exactly. What is is no. exactly. No, so of course, all these simulations have upper and lower jets for sure. Yes, they may not be symmetric. Like here. This is different. The, yeah, flow is different. Is not the flow velocity is different. The strengths may be different above and below. But what I think, or its confusion is somewhat valid with a, let's say, M87. If, for whatever we know about J, they are they are they are symmetric in that in that sense. So if I take M87, 